Hello everyone, thanks for stopping by and checking out my video. Uh, where I want to talk about, uh, real briefly, these accusations that have been just absolutely railed at Roy Moore here recently in the press. And I think anybody with a brain, I think anybody with any common sense, and that would be honest with themselves, that would know what really is going on right here. Because I don't think there's any doubt that the Democrats are trying their same strategy that they've tried time and time again, and that is to smear someone's name, because that's what this is, is a smear campaign against Roy Moore to uh, keep him from winning that Senate seat here in this upcoming election. And the Democrats have done it time and time again. Right before the 2000 election between Bush and Gore, they came out with a, a drunk driving charge that had been uh, uh, that J uh, George Bush was guilty of in, back in the 70s. So, you know, they're very much like the devil. And the Bible says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And, you know, they like, they like to bring up people's trash and they like to uh, make lies about people to discredit them and to attack their character. But I, this time I don't think it's going to work. And just like many other times in the past, it hasn't worked with the Democrats. But I don't think the Democrats are the only ones that's got their hands in this cookie jar. I think a lot of the Republicans are behind this. Uh, establishment Republicans, because Roy Moore is not a, an establishment uh, Republican. But Mitch McConnell, John McCain, all those guys are right in here with this. And they're basically, you know, trying to keep a good man from having a high place of authority where he can do a lot of good in this country. And good men usually don't seem to rise to the top in Washington. But in this video, I want to show you some things about this woman's testimony, this Beverly Nelson Young, about her uh, accusations that she's accusing Roy Moore of. And I want to show you some of the things that are really, really wrong and really, really just stink to high heaven about her testimony and her story about Roy Moore that she said happened back in 1977 when she was 16 years old and Roy Moore was like 30, something like that. But uh, the one thing that I noticed about her testimony, okay, she says in her story that she was working at this restaurant and it was late one night and the, and the restaurant had just closed and it was like 10 o'clock at night and her boyfriend was on her, uh, his way to pick her up from the restaurant. Well, when she was outside uh, waiting for her boyfriend at the restaurant, uh, Roy Moore pulls up in the car or was just leaving the restaurant, something like that. But she said that Roy Moore offered her a, a ride home. Well, my question is this. If your boyfriend is on the way, and he might be a little late, and you ain't got no way to call him, why would you get in the car with Roy Moore and just to leave your boyfriend hanging high and dry when he gets there, he doesn't know what, what happened to you? And because you didn't alert the people in the store that you were leaving with Roy Moore. So why would you do that? If your boyfriend's on the way to pick you up, why would you leave with this guy and not let your boyfriend know? That doesn't make any sense. If your boyfriend's on the way, he might be a little bit late, but you're still going to wait on him. Okay, and the next thing she, she said was, you know, she got into the car with Roy Moore. And this is the thing that really gets me about this story. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And that is... Roy Moore, she said, pulled to the back of the restaurant. She said she lived about two miles from the restaurant, but Roy Moore pulled off behind the restaurant, behind the dumpster, or in front of the dumpster, uh, to a place that was not that well lit, you know, in a very dark place behind the restaurant. Now, stop and think about something. If you're about to make a move on a 16-year-old girl, and you're a 30-year-old district attorney, and, you know, you are of high reputation, why would you pull into the very back of the restaurant to do your thing? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It makes more sense that you would go way off somewhere where you knew that nobody was going to, you know, drive up or walk out of the restaurant and you would be able to do your thing, you know, without being caught. At the back of the restaurant, number one, somebody could have walked out of that restaurant at any time to throw away trash in the dumpster that she said he pulled in front of or behind. But the point is, somebody could have walked out of the restaurant at any time to throw something away in the dumpster. Also, she said it, it was 10 o'clock when the restaurant closed. That means that people are probably still inside cleaning up and, you know, counting the registers and all that. So there's still people inside. So if you're Roy Moore and you're about to rape a 16-year-old girl, 
why would you do it right in the back of the restaurant? You know, she could scream for help. There's still people in the restaurant. A cop could pull up. Oh, by the way, by the way, this woman said her boyfriend was late, but he's on his way. So said boyfriend pulls up and catches you in the act. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Because if you're going to do something like that, you would go somewhere where you knew you weren't going to get caught. So that right there just stuck out to me more than anything. It doesn't make any sense. Secondly, she said she had bruises on her neck. Okay, if you've got bruises on your neck, that's pretty good evidence that you've been attacked. So why not go to the law? Why not go to the police and say, look, I got these bruises on my neck, and hey, this guy tried to attack me. And, you know, I know that forensics weren't back then what they are now, but, you know, investigators, homicide investigators still, you know, homicide, rape investigators, whatever, still were pretty good at their job. You can, you know, if somebody's been choking you or something like that, you can match their handprint or fingerprint or handprint or whatever and the size of their hand up with the bruises on the neck. There's all kind of things you can do. That's good evidence if you want to say, hey, this guy attacked me, but she didn't do that. She covered it up with makeup and went on with her life. Okay. Um, secondly, she said she noticed his shoes. And this doesn't make any sense to me either. Why, I mean, how she remembers his shoes 40 years later. She said they were brown and they were hush puppies. Well, here's what doesn't make sense about that to me. Okay, number one, why would you even pay attention to that? And number two, if it's dark and it's at night and you're in the car with this man, how can you see his shoes if it's dark and his, his feet are in the floorboard? Think about it. I mean, she said he either drove up and offered her a ride or walked out of the restaurant and offered her a ride. But either way, I just don't see why you would be paying attention to this man's shoes. Whoever's paying this woman put that in the story deliberately to make it look like this woman was so traumatized and that she's got such a good memory that she even remembered the color and make of his shoes. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it at all. It just looks like something that was inserted in there for that very reason. Okay? And secondly, okay, let's, let's think about this. Okay, her boyfriend eventually showed up. And she said that she didn't say anything to her boyfriend because he had had a, you know, he had a, a temper. He had a violent, you know, behavior. And so she didn't say anything because she, she didn't want him going to the police or going to Roy Moore and trying to hurt him or whatever. But here's the thing, okay? If you just got attacked in a car by a 30-year-old man, you're a 16-year-old girl, and he choked you to the point, to the point where we're saying, you're saying he choked you and made bruises on your neck. I know the bruises would not be visible at that point. They would form overnight, but you would still look very distressed, and you would still be able to tell someone that, you know, had that kind of a story that they'd just been through some kind of very, very stressful situation. You can't just compose yourself like that all of a sudden, you know, just minutes after it happened, and just act like nothing happened. If that man choked you enough to have bruises on your neck the next day, your boyfriend would be asking you questions. What happened? You're, are you okay? I mean there would be some kind of out exterior visible signs of that but no story whatsoever okay secondly or, or next is you know uh, this woman you know if you just watch her while she's talking you know her voice is very monotone and also how, why are you expressing so much emotion over something that happened 40 years ago I understand you say that it was a traumatic experience I understand that but I've seen women that's really been raped, and it's been 40 years later or longer, or maybe even just 20 years later, and they're talking very matter-of-factly because they went, they've dealt with it, they've, they're over it, and they've moved on with their life, and now they can talk about it. You know, they're, you know, But they don't show that much passion. You can tell that this is mustered up. You can tell that this woman is you know, acting. You can tell she's faking this. You know, and she's doing the patting her you know, self on the cheeks with... Uh, uh, Kleenex like on cue and you know if you'll just open your eyes you can tell this woman's acting there's no no doubt about that and you know I just want to say you know that uh, Mitch McConnell said that you know this woman's uh, testimony and all these accusations are very very credible well I would like to I would like to ask them what makes it so credible I, what about their testimony what about their accusations makes it makes them so credible what, to me, they're just giving the average run-of-the-mill attack story. You know, I was raped or I was attacked. There's nothing really credible about their testimony. And uh, also, you know, when, when this woman's talking, 
you know, you can just tell. You know, you can just tell. You know, it's like she's reading from a script. Like I'm reading from this list right now of the things that I wrote that down that I wanted to talk about. It's like she's rehearsing for a play or something. It's, you know how people read their lines from a play, you know, to rehearse before they're about to go on stage. That's that's the way she comes across. She does not come across as genuine, authentic, believable, credible. She doesn't come across as any of that. And shame on these people. Shame on all you people that believe this woman and all these other women. Shame on you because number one, you're being very shallow. You're proving to the world that you're very gullible, and you're also proving that you're very easily led. And because the timing of this is very telling, and everybody knows that's got a brain and is not, you know, got shades over their eyes, that the reason they're doing this is so this man will lose the election and not get that place in the Senate. Why didn't these women come forward years and years before when this man held public office? They didn't because there were no stories. This is all made up. And what should really scare us is this, is that anybody could come out with any kind of thing of any kind of trash about us on anybody at any time and make it look believable and people just follow it hook, line, and sinker. That's the scary thing about this. And I would like to point out two cases in the past where people were wrong when they thought that they were so right. And the first story I'd like to point out is Leo Frank. Some of you that know your history know all about Leo Frank. Leo Frank was a Jewish businessman in Marietta, Georgia back in the early 20th century. He owned a pencil factory and he was accused of murdering and raping a one Mary Fagan who was like a 14, 15 year old uh, girl that worked in his pencil factory at that time. Well, he was put on trial and found guilty, sentenced to death, and then they, you know, shortened his sentence to just life in prison. Well, some people of the community broke into prison and kidnapped him from the prison or the jail and hung him and lynched him. And it came out years and years later that this man was actually innocent. A little boy that was in the, uh, the pencil factory at the time saw um, a janitor threaten the girl and then rape the girl, girl. And he saw that this little boy saw what was going on and he told that little boy, he said, if you ever tell anybody what happened, I'll kill you. But the, the little boy grew up and when he was an old man, he finally came out with a story, told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and said, yeah, I saw it, but the man said if I ever tell anybody, he'd kill me and it scared me. So he never told anyone and it basically costed Leo Frank his life. And everybody was wrong. Everybody thought that they were right, this Jewish businessman taking advantage of this white American girl. Oh, we got to kill this guy. Well, they were wrong. They, they hung an innocent man. And secondly, you know, real shortly, Duke lacrosse team. Remember that? Remember the Duke lacrosse team? They got accused of rape. Remember those three guys that got accused, uh, that got accused of rape? And the woman who never came across as believable to me. I mean, I, her story never just made any sense. And it never came across as credible to me. Well, it was found out later on she was lying. So, there. Lots of people can think that they're right but that can be oh so wrong. And I think it's exactly what's going on in this case. Because unlike those other cases, there's a lot of political advantage and a lot of political strategy right here. They're doing this, they're dragging this man's name through the mud so that they can discredit him so that he will not win this election. And please understand something. Why should this man drop out of the, drop out of the race like John McCain, Mitch McConnell, all these other people want him to, over just simple allegations that I just proved to you could out could be wrong. It could be wrong. Everybody thought Leo Frank was guilty. Well, he was innocent. Everybody thought those three players on that Duke lacrosse team was guilty. Well, they were innocent. Well, nobody has any real sustainable, real proof that Roy Moore is guilty. None. So he should not drop out of this race. He should continue with this very sex, this very successful campaign, and he should continue going forward like he has always wanted to do and get that seat. He should just continue doing what he's doing because I believe the man is innocent. I mean, I believe the man is a godly man and I believe that that's why all these accusations are being levied against him because he's a servant of God and the devil, like he's always done, falsely accuses people. And oh, by the way, remember something? Remember Joseph? Remember Joseph, Potiphar's wife. It, it threw Joseph in prison cost him a lot of years of slavery, but God, what the devil meant for evil, God used for good. And I believe he's going to do that in this case as well, because I believe Judge Roy Moore, former Judge Roy Moore, which I hope is future Senator Roy Moore, 
I believe he's an it. I believe he's an innocent man, and I believe that God's going to give him victory. And this should be a big wake-up call to real Christians out there everywhere that want to take a stand for God. This is how the devil acts. This is the devil's strategy. If we want to make a stand for God, we could be next. Somebody could uh, throw false accusations against us when they're not true, but the whole world believe them because it works to their political advantage. And that's all that's going on right here. Just open your eyes and grow up. How would you like it if somebody accused you of something and they didn't have any evidence, it was just your word against theirs, but everybody all of a sudden just wanted to throw the book at you, wanted, to you, wanted you to give up your life and everything you worked very hard for over just simple accusations? How would you feel? Would you do it? Would you do it? I wouldn't, unless there was hardcore concrete evidence and these women were a little bit more believable other than just coming across as actresses that are just reading for a script and for a, for a, a, a play rehearsal because that's basically all Beverly Nelson Young comes across as. She needs the money, she's being paid, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. So, you use your own discretion and judgment and ask God, pray to God, who, who's right here? And don't just believe everything the crowd says because like in the case of Leo Frank, it's been proven the crowd can be wrong. Sometimes they can be dead wrong. That's all I got to say. You guys have a nice day and like my video, comment on, the, uh, comment on the comments below. Let me know what you think. Do you think Roy Moore is innocent or do you think he's guilty? So thanks for stopping by and checking out my video and God bless.